Good afternoon, colleagues. Chers collègues, bienvenue et merci pour votre intérêt. And welcome to our very special guest today. Bienvenue à notre invité d'aujourd'hui, Mark Carney. This is our seventh Senators for Climate Solutions event. It's an absolute pleasure to have our members come together to hear from Mr. Carney and have an opportunity to ask him our questions. I would like to welcome a new member uh, to Senators for Climate Solutions, the Honorable Clément Gignac, who is joining us today. Welcome, Senator. We're delighted to have you. Bienvenue, Senator Gignac. Merci. Well, <laughs> we, we love having you with us. Almost one year old, our Senators for Climate Solutions group has 44 members, Senators from all Senate groups and regions of our country. I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We have a few housekeeping announcements before we begin. We have prepared a list of questions that Senators from our group submitted in advance. Senator Kutcher and I will take turns asking Mr. Carney these questions, and I apologize in advance as we may, now, may not get to all of the questions submitted. There were many submitted. There's a lot of interest in this, uh, this uh, event. This session will be recorded and distributed to our members who are not able to be with us here today. Please note that simultaneous interpretation is provided for this meeting at the bottom. Uh, of your Zoom window, you can find the icon that indicates interpretation. Please click on that and choose your preferred language. Special thank you to Senators Saint-Germain and Senator Dean for their financial contributions to the interpretation, along with Senator Kutcher's office and my own. We feel that interpretation is an essential service and we will do our best to always ensure we have interpretation. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Mark Carney, who is the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. He's an economist and a banker who served as the governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020. And prior to that, as everybody I'm sure here knows, as governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 until 2013. Previously, he worked at Goldman Sachs as well as the Canadian Department of Finance. He is currently vice chair of Brookfield Asset Management and their head of transition investing. He is a long time and well-known advocate for sustainability, specifically with regards to the management and reduction of climate risks. Last year, Mr. Carney published his influential national bestseller entitled Values, Building a Better World for All. It is a weighty tome. I know. <laughs> I have it, and I'm in it, <laughs> but it's very well worth reading. Welcome, Mr. Carney. We are thrilled to have you join our climate senators today. Now on to our fireside chat. I'll ask the first couple of questions, if I could, Mr. Carney. Mr. Carney, our group, Senators for Climate Solutions, has come together to promote climate action. Your book, Values, Building a Better World for All, is about achievable solutions to rebalance our world. Coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and in the context of other major global challenges we are experiencing, could you touch on the reason you wrote this book, your major observations from the book and what solutions you are proposing? Mr. Carney? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, I'd like to thank all the senators for uh, your attendance today and for what you're doing. Is, as was just outlined, coming together to find solutions to this issue uh, that support all Canadians. Um, I wrote the book, uh, I, you know, my experience, and I'll, I'll try and be brief on this, but my experience as a central bank governor in Canada and the UK was one of crisis. It was one of a series of crises. I started with the financial crisis. Uh, there was the Euro crisis, um, uh, the Brexit crisis, uh, the climate crisis building throughout. And then actually my last weeks were the start of uh, the health crisis that we've all been living through, the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, part of the question that I was trying to ask myself was, was there some common element to these? Um, and, uh, and then building the out from that in terms of solutions. Uh, and I, I, you're right, it, I probably could have uh, edited it more, uh, more judiciously, so I apologize for that. But to, to get to the essence of what's most relevant, I think, uh, for our discussion today 
is that um, I, I was trying, trying to draw out the relationship between value, value in the market and values, values in society. And that is a two-way relationship. We need certain values for markets to function well. Uh, many of Senators, Senator Zignac, I'm sure knows this well from his time in the financial markets. Um, we need regulation, of course, but we also need certain principles that underpin this. And this was part of uh, Adam Smith's, the other part of Adam Smith's genius was the importance uh, of those values, not just the power of the market. But, um, and to get to the topic today, um, if society, if Canada is clear about what it values, sustainability, solidarity, um, uh, fairness uh, in our society, then we can help put the market in service of those values. And that's where this starts to come together in terms of policy prescriptions. Um, for a long time, Canadians have supported sustainability, um, uh, environmental causes, uh, but that has not necessarily translated into clear objectives. Um, that began to change over the course of the last few years, not just in Canada, but globally. And Canada helped lead many of these changes. So the objectives uh, became crystallized around pathways of emission reductions and more specifically to the objective of, of achieving net zero. Now I should acknowledge as the senators know um, that net zero, getting to net zero doesn't solve all environmental issues, far from it. Uh, issues of biodiversity, for example, and, and nature uh, will still be with us. Um, and it doesn't solve certainly societal issues, fairness, solidarity in that transition and in the end uh, position. But it is absolutely necessary to arrest climate change. Uh, we can't stabilize temperatures at one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, even unless we get to net zero. Um, and so having that objective, that value of society, sustainability, and mapping it into net zero as an objective, then creates some of the conditions for the market to work in service of that objective. And so what the book, and, and I think we'll get into this more specifically, mm -hmm. uh, the work that I've been doing with others uh, over the last few years has been how to organize the financial system, the financial markets, with that objective to ensure that the decisions that are taken in the financial system take this objective of Canadians, sustainability and more specifically getting to net zero, that uh, those markets take that into account in their lending decisions, in their investment decisions, in their risk management decisions. And it's through that process when brought together with the objectives of Canadians, the, the preferences of Canadians, what kind of goods we buy or services we, we, we use, and very importantly, the policies of government today and in the future, crucially in the future, the credibility of those policies in the future, as that comes together, then we get the investment today to solve the problems tomorrow. And that's the virtuous cycle that we can start, that, that we can set up. And we're starting to do that. The reason for your inquiry uh, and your interest is we're not all the way there. Uh, right. And there's a lot more to be done. But so the objective of the book started in, and I'll finish here, you know, in history, from my own experience, but then trying to broaden it out to the history of economic thought and philosophy, and then make it practical around specific issues of how do we apply this relationship between value, the market, and the values, what Canadians uh, want. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and as you said, we will be drilling down into, into a number of the areas that you, you dealt with in the book. Um, we, we also have a, a group that has worked uh, significantly on the issue of, of prosperity uh, for our country. So this next question uh, is one that I think uh, will resonate with that group. Mr. Carney, you've said that the goal of net zero is the greatest commercial opportunity of our time. Could you tell us why you believe this to be the case? And could you expand on what you believe the implications are for Canada of this greatest commercial opportunity of our time? Particularly if you could also relate that to the federal commitments outlined in the recently released 2030 emissions reduction plan. I mean, don't, don't limit yourself to that, but if you could uh, speak about this. Yeah, very good. The, um, I, I think the first thing to say is that on a high level, conceptual level, was we have, we're facing this virtually existential risk, obviously in the extreme, it is an existential risk, but this, this fundamental risk um, of mounting physical uh, climate impacts 
that affects will affect the lives and livelihoods of uh, of, of all Canadians. Um, and um, you know, I can say this uh, being from the north, uh, and will affect us disproportionately um, in the north of Canada um, and then uh, down through Canada. Um, so we have this fundamental problem increasingly understood and um, and uh, and the impacts just beginning to be felt um, uh, and all of the and, and I'll say but just by way of background um, one of the things that I responsibilities I had in the past was to oversee uh, the insurance industry and the and the um, uh, the reinsurance industry, particularly Lloyd's of London. And so if you have that responsibility, you become very familiar with climate modeling and what's happening. And, and the, the impact of extreme weather has been, uh, has been on the upside of the modeling. So it has been as severe or more severe than expected. So uh, there's more in the pipeline. Anyway, so we have this big risk. The extent to which you can solve a problem that society has decided to address, you are creating value. Now, the question is, um, how do we put numbers uh, around that value that's created? And let me give a couple of lenses on that. Um, the first is in terms of the global investment need um, to address climate change, the incremental amount of investment is something on the order, and there's various ranges of investments. I'll take the lower end of that, but is about $2 trillion of additional investment a year in the energy sector alone. So it's not just the investment that today is put into oil and gas and transferring that to uh, renewable or cleaner energy over time, but it's an additional two trillion uh, for reasons that'll become apparent, I think, in our discussion. I'm sure you're familiar with, but we'll raise in our discussion. Um, in, and that is an enormous, it sounds like a big number. It is an enormous number. It's about two percentage points of GDP um, uh, year in, year out for 30 years. Um, within Canada, it's a similar order of magnitude over the course of the next 25, 30 years of what we need to do. We need to do it about an additional $60 billion of investment uh, in energy systems, about four times the run rate at present of clean energy, that various estimates, but let's say three to four times that run rate. So huge investments that will be required. Um, now, that is that is solving a problem um, and it is creating value and jobs and uh, GDP in the, in the context of that. The, the second element, and I'll finish my answer with this, just in terms of, so, so the, the first is just the scale of the investment opportunity. The, the second element though of value creation or commercial opportunity um, is that um, increasingly companies, regardless of sectors they're in, will be judged in part about whether they are becoming part of the solution to climate change or they remain part of the problem. So in other words, do they have plans to reduce their emissions consistent with the transition that Canada is undertaking um, and uh, as laid out in the uh, emission reduction uh, plan? And I'll come, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, or are their pathways um, inconsistent or diverging from the pathways that are required in the building sector, in the um, heavy industry sector, um, in oil and gas, et cetera. And what is going to happen, and it's already happening, is that that will be one of the determinants of the value, the equity value of a company. Um, and we see this um, in jurisdictions that have been a bit ahead of Canada in terms of information about um, the, the, uh, the emissions uh, positions of companies, and have arguably been a bit ahead in terms of the predictability of climate policy. So um, just to put a number around that, in Europe, um, uh, European equities, if, if you look at the valuation premiums of companies within a sector that are low emission, emission versus higher emissions, um, that premium has more than tripled over the course of the last decade as more information has come. So it's increasingly a driver of value and it's Again, for those who follow statistics, it's it's a very high correlation, about 0.7 correlation with the climate performance, uh, just around net zero, the net zero element, not a broader ESG metric or anything like that. So we'll see that. I, I, I'm pretty confident we're, we'll see that increasingly in Canada. Therefore, value creation opportunity, and and this is what we want, and this is where I get to the ERP, um, because this will flow money, not just to green projects, 
Um, I mean, but yes, we want wind and solar and uh, batteries and hydrogen and all those aspects. But very importantly, to those projects in uh, industries that are heavy emitters, um, in the oil and gas sector, in um, the building uh, sector, um, the transportation sector and others, where companies have plans and investments to get those emissions down. Um, and what the uh, part of what the ERP does, and I'm not the I appreciate I wasn't involved in the development, so I'm not uh, you know as as totally familiar. But what I see in the ERP and other climate policies um, in Canada, and what I see elsewhere in the world that works, are the types of policies that have very clear objectives, regulations, and or prices towards the end of this decade um, and, um, and are credible in terms of how those are built. And I'll, I'll come to specific examples. Um, the reason I say that though, to get to the punchline is that um, things like a $170 price per ton for carbon in 2030 that's legislated and as you know, backed up now or intended to be backed up with a carbon contract for difference, something that was in the ERP, very important uh, initiative. Um, well, that's, that's what's decisive for investment today, for um, uh, you know, companies that, um, uh, they, they know the carbon price is $50 today, but what's relevant is when the plant comes on is that that will be the price at that point. Um, and if they're saving carbon, that's the, the calculation they use. Um, objectives that are reinforced in the ERP, although not formally um, or as formally uh, developed, if I can say it that way, uh, such as the clean grid for 2035 or uh, the moratorium on new, new internal combustion engine vehicles 2035. Again, those have a similar impact. And I'll, I'll stop with this, which is that in the UK, um, where I have some familiarity uh, and in Europe, those types of, if I can call them deep decarbonization policies that have certainty in the future, um, clarity, you know, relative simplicity and clarity, uh, but give industry, businesses, people time to adjust and the financial sector a direction of where the money should go. Um, those are the types of policies that will deliver the highest impact and value creation in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, 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 growth, jobs, um, uh, but also uh, candidly um, creating value for companies that then can be uh, reinvested in the economy. Thank you. They're, well, they're very, very helpful. Over to you, Stan. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Th th thanks, Mr. Carney. I'm just going to drill down a little bit on uh, just picking sure. off from what you said. Um, last year, our biggest banks, known as the Big Five, uh, sign signed on to the United Nations uh, Net Zero Banking Alliance. Uh, we also know that the big five are amongst the world's top lenders to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, given the significant emissions associated with both fossil fuel production and downstream combustion, many people have argued that the banks need to quickly reduce these oil and gas sector investments, while others are arguing that these investments are actually necessary to moving these companies to net zero. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on this particular issue. Yeah, well, it's uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, it's an important question, and of course, in the Canadian system, the banks are at the heart of so much. Um, so it's um, it, it's it's critical what they do and the pathways they follow. And I I, I, th I should start uh, by um, commending them for joining the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Um, what they've signed up for is not just Net Zero 2050. And to be clear, and I know you know this, but just to read it into the record. Uh, what's important is the financed emissions, so the emissions of their clients, the people they lend to or invest in. Um, and what's important as well is the scope three emissions of those clients as well, because in the most difficult areas, oil and gas, scope three is, um, is everything, uh, if you will, or almost everything. Um, so they've signed up for that. They've also signed up for their fair share by 2030 and for annual reporting um, with decarbonization plans, which are due in about 18 months time. So there's a lot of work they need to do from commitment to plan to, to action. That's the first thing. The second is what's, what's hugely important here is the pathway and particularly for the oil and gas sector. Um, now we have some very high level, the collective we have very high level pathways for oil and gas 
from the International Energy Agency, uh, which says the world should finance about 400 to $600 billion a year for existing infrastructure in the transition on the oil and gas side, and more than quadruple that for the uh, clean energy side. So it's relevant what our banks are doing on one versus the other and what the pathway is. But then secondly, to go back to the previous question, what's relevant is um, the pathway for our energy sector that is developed and the emissions pathway for our energy sector um, that comes out of uh, not just the emission, the ERP, so-called ERP, but our broader policy, federal and provincial policy uh, for that. And uh, are the banks, is their financing consistent with plans that are getting those emissions down? And we may have a chance to talk to it and I'll hand back to you so I'm using the time effectively. Uh, but um, uh, what we, I'll, I'll make two points. One is that we will want disclosure from the banks in Canada and globally that is much clearer about what type of projects they're financing in the energy sector, uh, what is for new development, uh, what is for carbon reduction, uh, what is a transfer of existing assets, those, uh, those elements, and how is that consistent with the pathways? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll make two final points. One of the things globally where we have a, a, a hole, quite frankly, is I mentioned the IEA, but that's very high level. There is not a quote, science-based pathway for the oil and gas sector. There is for many other sectors. There isn't for uh, oil and gas. Um, so therefore we need something from the Canadian side and uh, GFAN is the group that I help uh, chair uh, we're actually going to help develop one globally as well, because otherwise people are comparing to, you know, they don't have a comparison of what, what good looks like. Um, and then the last point I want to make, and we, uh, I'll defer to you in terms of how much we want to speak about it, um, but there are some quite substantial investments in the oil and gas sector that are possible um, in order to get emissions down quite substantially from scope one, scope two. Uh, development and, uh, and and of course we will likely need our banks and our pension funds uh, to help finance it those uh, those investments if they come to pass. Well, thank you for that. Um, in terms of how uh, helping us understand how the banking sector in Canada might fit into the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero that you actually helped catalyze or, or, or birth it. Uh, how, how does that fit? Uh, help us understand more about that initiative and, 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 and how, does, uh, how, how do we fit into that and, and, and what's happening uh, on that uh, road, particularly as we're approaching COP27? Yeah, so the first, the, what we look to do with the Glasgow Financial Alliance is to take, there were a series of initiatives, although there was not one for banking, there were a series of initiatives uh, in asset management for pension funds, effectively so-called asset owners, the insurance industry, and now banking, um, that were making commitments to net zero. We, we were looking to level those up and raise those up to a common standard, mm -hmm. net zero 2050, fair share 2030, the same accounting for the emissions of their portfolios, um, decarbonization plans, annual reporting, et cetera. So all of that's coming together. Um, and then to get the various components to work together to make that happen. Um, so the banks are part of that um, and are going to be held to that standard. Now, what we're doing right now is uh, as this alliance is we're converting, uh, well, we're not converting the individual banks and others will convert their commitments into action plans. But we are uh, literally uh, in two weeks time on the 15th, a little more than two weeks, uh, 15th of June, we are setting out a series of frameworks for what is best practice on a financial institution net zero plan. Um, what are these sectoral pathways that we refer these plans to? Um, how do you wind down the so-called stranded asset? It could be in the coal industry, could be in other industries, because we don't want to push all those stranded assets into the darkness and have them run for longer than is appropriate. Um, so how do you wind down that responsibly? So we're going out for public consultation with the intention of completing this uh, by Sharm el-Sheikh, the COP27 in November, um, that this is the approach. If you are a responsible financial institution, you're committed to helping your clients get on the path to net zero, 
this is what you want from your clients. This is the information you want. This is how your homework should be marked. And this is uh, how you're going to report what you do. Uh, so it's very much a necessary condition for the system, uh, system to work. Um, so our banks fit into it you know, from that perspective. And we've already seen the first early cuts of some of these plans. Uh, they will become more ambitious and more, I, well, I'll use this word granular, more detailed um, and uh, uh, in, 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 uh, over the course of the next uh, year. Um, and I should say one other thing and I'll hand back, which is that one thing we're doing, this one other, you know, the system's being built very rapidly. And one thing that all stakeholders deserve um, employees, shareholders, communities, Canadians, all Canadians deserve, people around the world deserve, is a way to go, uh, is, is an open source database to go and compare um, these things on an apples to apples basis so we can judge who's ambitious, who's doing well, who isn't, uh, and have it properly interrogated. So we're going to help build that up uh, as part of, uh, as part of GFANS. Okay, that's, I find that very helpful. Thank you very much for explaining in a way that I can understand. It's sort of uh, I, my, my, a little bit of comment on this before I hand it over to Mary. It, it, it's a bit like building the engine while you're flying the plane, um, which, which, is, which is amazing. Well, we are definitely, if I may just respond to that, that's definitely, that is the right analogy. Uh, you know, the collective we have left this late. Um, Three or four years ago, for most financial institutions, uh, climate was a corporate social responsibility issue. It wasn't a core strategic issue. They were not committed to net zero. In fact, to put a number on it, two years ago, a little more than two years ago, only $5 trillion in the global financial industry was committed to net zero. Now it's $130 plus trillion. So there's a huge shift. But what is good in that commitment? How exactly do you build these plans? How can the world compare what's good, what's not uh, on those plans? And all of that is being built to add to the flying, you know, building while we're flying the plane. Um, the navigation system for this, if I can try and extend the analogy, which is the accounting system, the disclosure system for finance and climate, which you, you may, I'm sure are familiar with the TCFD, which was a private sector initiative. Now that's becoming a public sector initiative through the International Sustainability Standards Board, co-located in Montreal, a Canadian success. Um, but that navigation system, that disclosure system is also being built at the same time we're building the plane while it's flying. Um, and, and there's a to, and finish with the analogy, and there's a big climate storm coming <laughs> at us. Uh, so uh, we need to get all of this uh, completed at, at, uh, at ha with, with haste. Thank you. Well, Thank and, you. And and while we've got that climate storm coming, we've got this inflation storm uh, that we're mm. uh, that's upon us right now, not just here in Canada but around the world. Uh, so, if you could take a minute just to help us understand um, what the possible impacts of climate change might be on inflation itself, okay? And then do you have any ideas about how, for instance, the Bank of Canada could manage inflation in such a way that mitigates the damaging impacts of climate change now and into the future? So we know there's a lot of factors affecting uh, the current uh, wave of inflation that we're experiencing right now, but let's bring it back to, to climate change uh, if, if we could. Yeah, the, um, you know, the short term impacts of climate change on inflation um, principally relate to um, the physical impacts of climate change and the disruption or it's their contribution to uh, supply chain uh, uh, disruptions. And um, unfortunately, also in some case, and I, I hesitate to say this, but well, it, it, this, this is the way things are trending at the moment. Um, as senators will be aware, Canadians will be aware, we have a looming food crisis um, um, driven uh, first and foremost by the war, uh, Russia's uh, war, unjust war in Ukraine. Um, and and you know, the, the calamity that's coming from that, not just in 
in grain, but also in fertilizers and the knock-on effects. But on top of that, we have extreme weather, a series of extreme weather uh, events, uh, uh, extreme heat in India, which is affecting uh, the crops there. Um, farmers in Western Canada will know that it's been uh, much wetter than usual. Um, and so the planning uh, has been delayed. We have problems in uh, Brazil that are also uh, climate related or weather related. Uh, so, you know, we have elements of this which uh, affect um, supply chains uh, with some disruptions also, unfortunately, uh, it appears coming together at a time where we have um, uh, man-made uh, or human-made uh, problems uh, uh, because of uh, Russia's aggression. Um, so there's that aspect that flows through to in, uh, inflation without question. Um, I think the um, I, what I would underscore is that with respect to the medium term, um, over the course of this decade, and I've, I've, I've done some analysis on this and, and, and spoken to this a bit, is that um, one would expect that there is uh, some inflationary impact over the med medium term from climate change uh, because of the scale of the restructuring that's required um, in various industries. So anytime you have a big shift in industry, um, uh, because of a new trade deal or because of, um, uh, in this case, um, uh, moving towards a lower carbon future, you, people are changing jobs, um, uh, some uh, new investments are being put in place, there, is, uh, there are some frictions that always come in the economy. Now, Canada is a very flexible economy, very flexible labor market, so we will have fewer than, of those than others, uh, but we, you know, we have some of our own challenges. So that process uh, does bring some uh, in, uh, inflationary pressures in the medium term. They, you know, it's readily addressable uh, by the central bank, uh, particularly when you have a persistent shock and a relatively predictable shock, as opposed to um, uh, a one-off, um, you know, warlike or, or, or weather-related uh, shock. Uh, I think what's important to recognize is, as well, is that what we're doing is moving to actually a lower cost energy system. Um, so when we, we, we have this period and then the payback, the positive payback is that the marginal costs of uh, uh, energy and electricity will be an increasing uh, component of that um, uh, will be much lower um, and less volatile. Uh, so, you know, if we just take a step back and look at the current situation uh, from a global energy perspective, which affects Canada, I mean, we do have a system which is unreliable. Um, uh, we've seen it with uh, Russia's aggression, but there are other factors that can knock out supply and lead to very extreme price volatilities. Uh, it's unaffordable in many respects. We've got billions of people who don't have access to the energy, so it's inaccessible. And of course, it's unsustainable as well because it's building the climate crisis. So we have a current system that, as the, as the Brits would say, is not fit for purpose, um, and we need to move to this system. There is some friction that comes with that um, and uh, some element inflation. Now, what the Bank of Canada can do, and obviously I don't want to be in a, uh, and you're not asking me to, to be in a position to, you know, to suggest to my successor uh, what they should do. Over the medium term, though, what one of the, um, so I'm not doing that, but what the bank does uh, is, is, is twofold, uh, and they're already doing this. One is understanding uh, the exposures and how the financial system and the Canadian economy is going to adjust to this. So they've done a tremendous amount of work on this through climate stress testing with OSFI, through scenario analysis, through understanding the risks and helping the system as a whole. They've contributed to the system as a whole, including personally the governor and his uh, co-leadership of uh, an expert panel a few years ago to ensuring that the market has the information it needs to make this shift. All of that reduces, it does two things. It, it, it reduces any inflationary pressures and actually uh, pays bigger dividends in growth and jobs uh, sooner for Canadians. Um, and then the other thing they can do uh, and will do is in terms of conventional monetary policy, they take this into account uh, with other factors so that they set uh, a monetary policy appropriate to the 2% target. Thank you. And of course, we wouldn't want to put you in a position to be <laughs> to be uh, recommending things to your uh, successor. Uh, switching gears a little bit here now. Um, 
in budget 2022, Canada's budget 22, uh, there were tax credits for carbon capture, utilization and storage projects. Um, you're probably very aware there's a controversy uh, around this, uh, you know, not going, not going far enough, you know, coming from certain elements in the oil and gas sector, uh, going too far, you're, you know, you're sustaining, you know, a, a sector that, uh, yes, maybe you're going to be dealing with, uh, you know, capturing at, at source, reducing uh, carbon uh, emissions in the production side of things, but it's still going to be combusted and, you know, the whole argument around that. Um, one of our senators has asked, uh, whether you believe this uh, investment in carbon capture, utilization, and storage is an effective means uh, to get to net zero um, uh, in terms of the investment in the oil and gas sector or any other sectors that you'd like to speak of uh, in, in this issue of CCUS. Yeah. Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that there is a transition in um, oil and gas, um, as, as we all know, um, and uh, Canada has an opportunity to uh, play a role in that transition, uh, and certainly from a North American energy uh, system. Um, uh, it, is, it has to be um, in a position, and I think the industry uh, recognizes this, um, where uh, our oil and gas is 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 low carbon, ultimately no carbon, um, is and is low cost um, and is reliable. I mean, it, the reliability is there, uh, but the the other metrics of energy security and sustainability are are low cost and and low carbon. Um, and so uh, many efforts are there to get the marginal cost down, so the additional you know the additional barrel cost, and the industry has been very good at that. In term, and there has been some progress on emissions, but not the orders of magnitude that are required. And uh, the industry has, uh, has banded together to, um, uh, to make major investments or potentially major investments in carbon capture and storage um, in order to um, effectively eliminate um, uh, scope one, scope two uh, emissions from a barrel of, uh, of uh, oil sands uh, oil, um, which uh, if that's successful will during the transition will preserve a role for uh, that oil in continental energy security, which is a good thing for uh, uh, the main customers, which are American actually, uh, good thing for Canada, good thing um, uh, on the margin for the planet because it's lower carbon. We want lower carbon barrels delivered. Um, and the only way to get that, uh, or the main way to get there is through uh, successful carbon capture and storage. Now. There are different views on whether or not this technology will be truly successful at scale. Um, I would say that we are seeing um, some examples of it being successful. Uh, there's a company called Entropy where I should disclose that my other uh, role at uh, Brookfield, there's a, we have an investment in a company called Entropy, Western Canadian carbon capture uh, company that you know, is a, that is a commercial investment. Um, uh, the question is, can we do, can the world or can Alberta rather, uh, or Canada um, do this at a scale uh, for the oil sands as a whole? I think that the, um, the investment tax credit that was provided in the budget is the right approach to help that, uh, to help that process along, that there will need to be very substantial private capital that goes in um, to develop this. And I, my, it's not for me to say, but my view is that the industry uh, will uh, will come in behind that, um, as will the provincial government, um, because this is necessary. It's necessary for competitiveness uh, and it's necessary uh, for sustainability. I would further make the point that others, and many, some others do, which is that from a Canadian perspective, from a national competitiveness perspective, jobs diversification perspective, um, developing successful carbon capture and storage um, expertise, technologies, and, 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 and actual success with that um, is, is, is a necessary condition for us to develop a blue hydrogen uh, industry and to um, realize the potential of uh, much of our natural gas resources as well. And, and so all of that, and all of that is about investment, jobs, growth, uh, and greater sustainability in Canada. 
um, then there's a question of whether we would export the technology and the expertise to others who might need it. Um, but just in and of itself, the advantages in Canada. But to uh, are there to be clear though, and um, uh, and I, you know, those who are more expert than I would, I think, say this. Um, because I've heard them say it, um, the, the industry is coming together because they're looking to pool expertise uh, because the need for this is in relatively short period of time. And so, um, and they, they know it can work at certain scales and they want it to work at industrial industry-wide uh, scale. Uh, and so uh, there is there are execution uh, issues around it. It is not as simple as, um, and I'll finish with this, um, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward now um, to uh, build a wind farm, uh, to build a solar array. Um, uh, you know, these technologies are proven. You can do it at scale. You have to get obviously planning permission, and you have to have some operational expertise. But you don't need the support for it. That was not the case 10, 15 years ago. That changed in part because of similar types of support uh, in Europe uh, and in the UK specifically which took those technologies, which were uneconomic and dragged them into becoming wildly economic and the world is benefiting from that. Um, we're in that position. We, Canada, are in that position with carbon capture and storage, which we need for our oil sands industry and we need for our potential blue hydrogen uh, industry. Uh, doesn't mean we're gonna get what we need. You don't always get what you need, but um, we can make those investments and that's what the government and the industry intends to do. Um, it is also true just on the cusp this um, for uh, green hydrogen, which is getting closer and closer to becoming economic, but is not quite there. And so uh, there's logic to uh, providing uh, support to accelerate uh, the development and application of, uh, of, of those technologies. Uh, and look, if, if we were addressing climate change over the course of the next 50 or 75 years, and we had a carbon budget that was consistent with that, uh, there might be less support initially and less urgency around it, but that's not the case. Um, and, um, and we have to, as a country, my judgment last thing is we have to decide where we concentrate our efforts. And it seems to me, well, success is not assured. It's never assured when you're dealing with technologies. Well, it's not assured. It is more likely in this case, and it serves multiple purposes. The industry, the existing industry, potential future industry, potential export industry. Thank you. All right, that's that's a good way to think about it, actually. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to switch slightly back to, to, to an area that you covered a little bit. Uh, that was the, uh, the um, illegal war in Russia. Um, and, and I like to think about the, the global destabilizing impacts of that war as the three Fs. Uh, and you did two of them, food, fertilizer, but we didn't do fuel. So uh, the, the issue here is that we know Russia is a major exporter, global and European of, of energy. And uh, the case for a rapid and clean uh, transition has been made stronger, some would argue, because of, uh, of the problem with uh, Russia's supply. Yet uh, we hear that Canada is set to increase its oil and gas production to alleviate the increased need in Europe. I'd like to hear your insights and thoughts on this uh, issue, both on a climate solutions front and an economic front. And what impact do you think uh, this will have on uh, Canada's oil and gas sector as it ramps up to meet this demand, and also at the same time on our net zero goals? How, how do we square that circle? Yeah, I think the, uh, the first thing to say, and I, I like your three Fs, I'm like you and every all the senators, so uh, distressed that we're in uh, in this situation, and uh, uh, and more distressed on the human uh, suffering uh, in Ukraine uh, because of it, and the human suffering that will be felt globally as a consequence of uh, uh, those three Fs. Um, I think uh, I think the following: one is that um, what the war does is that it means that we, the world, will use up more of our carbon budget in the short term. Uh, in virtually every case the displacement of existing energy sources from Russia, the knock-on effects of that, mean that um, a higher carbon fuel source will be burned. 
Um, so one of the impacts is not on the oil side, as you know, but is in the global gas market, uh, which has been made even tighter because of uh, the Russian challenge and, and will get worse now because of the sanction in the announcement today on uh, cutting off Netherlands, not surprising, but it'll get worse. That displaces gas around the world that then in most cases goes to coal, uh, whether it's in Indonesia or China or elsewhere. So more of the carbon budget uh, will be used up. And you know this is just raw physics. This is not, um, uh, the, you know, the, the atmosphere doesn't care why the carbon lands there. It, it just is affected by it. So it makes the challenge harder. First thing. Second is that uh, there is a need to strand, both for ge geopolitical reasons, uh, Russian assets. So if, if they are being displaced, um, there is in the short term a need both to conserve, and that's one of the elements in Europe, but also to provide new uh, hydrocarbon sources uh, that can come from various, uh, various places, um, Canada included. Um, the third thing, though, is that um, there is a difference between what can happen in the short term, which candidly is not that much, um, and what can happen in the medium term to make a material difference to the energy system, which is somewhere around the five-year uh, horizon. Um, most LNG projects, and I, you know, uh, one of the things I did earlier in my career was to uh, do financing for LNG projects. Um, uh, and uh, those projects take a good five years to develop uh, from, from concept to build to, uh, uh, to deliver a, a full new LNG train. Um, and those projects tend to run uh, once up and running for 30, 40, you know, potentially plus years, uh, depending on the underlying reserve. Um, so in thinking about material new LNG, wherever it comes from, whether it comes from Canada, whether it comes from elsewhere, into Europe, uh, it's not going to run for 40 years because Europe is, is not running a climate policy that has material gas uh, in, after 2050. Um, so it's going to run for 25 years. That, that changes the economics of, of, of that project unless it uh, and I know there have been some talks around this, it's been in the public domain, I'm not betraying anything, uh, unless that project has some optionality uh, to shift from LNG to hydrogen, uh, whether it's ammonia delivered or uh, some other aspect of it. Uh, so that is, a, that is a consideration. This is this, this and uh, uh, having spoken with a number of very senior European policymakers and others, uh, they are not you know, they're, they're, they're very focused on energy security, sustainability. They understand that to really move the needle on um, energy capacity, it's that five-year horizon. Therefore, in the five-year horizon, what's being compared is LNG with that 25-year horizon hydrogen optionality, ramping up wind, solar, in some cases using nuclear, existing nuclear, some cases, not Germany, but some cases. Um, uh, and, uh, and 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 cons and conservation measures. Um, so the economics are, are shaped like that. And very often, what one reads about in the paper or, or or the public discourse talks about things in the very short term. Well, there's not that much that can be done in the very short term. That's the that's the brutal reality uh, for all aspects, actually, of your for all of your Fs, um, uh, which is the challenge. I, I should say, with with the one caveat that actually on fertilizer and food. Um, uh, you know, depending on the course of the war, uh, there, th things could change more quickly than they can change on uh, on fuel. Great. Well, th well, thank you for that. Um, and then, and sl slightly shifting gears now, a little bit more to the civil society uh, components of this. Uh, the the, the uh, high level expert group on net zero emission commitments of non state entities have been recently formed, and, and Catherine McKenna from our own country is, is, is now the head of that group. Uh, it's an important role and uh, yeah. a new organization. Um, how, how can a Canadian government uh, in an active way uh, play a role in helping and incentivizing Canadian firms to report and manage their climate related financial risk? Something to do with the answer you had on the banks earlier. Sure. Uh, and, and how can uh, we uh, as Canadians help ensure that companies will actually follow through with their net zero claims. Yeah, so the first thing to say is that um, uh, the, the high level expert group that uh, Ms. McKenna is uh, chairing, it's, uh, it's an important group and uh, 
full credit uh, uh, to her commitment <laughs> just after she finishes one uh, you know, set of difficult roles, she steps into uh, another one. Um, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's her character and uh, we're, we're fortunate for that. The, um, what can the Canadian government do? Uh, uh, let, me, let me frame it this way, which is that, and, and I should say in this regard, Canadian governments and Canadian authorities, because there's a federal provincial aspect to it and a regulatory aspect to it. But where the world is headed is um, first to mandatory climate disclosure. Um, six years ago, um, uh, what was called the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure was, um, was catalyzed by the G20 at COP21 in Paris. I was part of that. Um, and in effect, uh, the, the charge was put out to the private sector was to answer this question. What information do you need as the financial sector in order to manage climate related risks? Okay, risks, not opportunities, difference here. Um, and do you have that information? And what's the, what's the quote, decision useful uh, information? It's an American term I'd never heard before, decision useful information. Um, and so the private sector gets together and it comes up with an answer and gradually hundreds and then thousands of companies, including Canadian companies, start to report this information. And we start to see the types of things I was talking about earlier in terms of valuation premiums and things. Now, the private sector can only take this so far. What you get is leading companies and leading financial institutions doing this. Um, but we're now in a position where you have $100 trillion in the private financial sector saying, we want everyone to do this because we need this information. Um, and what happened at COP is that this new body, this International Sustainability Standards Board was set up as, as the second pillar of global disclosure standards. So there's something, those, those of us who you know, or look at accounting or, or read annual reports or work with companies know that the Canadian accounting system is, is, is part of something called the IFRS. It's a similar, similar, not exactly the same, accounting system, disclosure system to everywhere around the world with the exception of the United States, basically. This is about climate disclosure everywhere around the world uh, with the exception of the United States, so the United States intends through the SEC to do something very similar. Anyways, what's my point? My point is moving from voluntary to mandatory. So you have the coverage of all companies and a level playing field to manage not just risk, but now opportunities because the focus has, has, has become as much on the opportunities here. So that's the first thing we can do. The second thing is what's happening is that we, we talked a bit about net zero transition plans of financial institutions, also companies are developing these. And what will happen over time, it's already started in the UK, they announced this at COP, um, is coming in Europe, uh, will be that these plans are mandatory for similar reasons. Because we want the market to be able to work uh, in a way that you, know, you can judge who is a plan, which plan do I want to back? And we need to get capital, particularly in Canada, where we have lots of heavy emitting industries. We want to get capital to those businesses that have a plan to get them down. As I said earlier, the easy bit, pretty easy bit, is to build wind farms and solar. We need a lot of that. Hydro, we need that. You know, maybe we need some additional nuclear. But, but the, 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 almost the higher impact is to go to the steel company, uh, the auto manufacturer, uh, the consumer goods company, et cetera, that has higher emissions and, and, and get capital. And for that, you need this type of information and you need it in a consistent way across. Last point, if I may, I'm sorry, I know we're short on time, but this is a critical point, which is one of the things that companies are being asked by those who provide them with capital is not just what are your emissions you know, for your building and for your travel, your scope and your power that you use, your so-called scope one, scope two, but what are the emissions up and down your value chain, the emissions of your suppliers, the emissions of those who use the products, so-called scope three. Mm. The importance of having scope three in, and it's some, there's some measurement issues around it, but they're, they're addressable. Um, the importance of having scope three in is it aligns incentives with the company and their suppliers, many of which are small, medium-sized enterprises, becomes in their interest to help those businesses get their emissions down. 
um, and as well in terms of uh, uh, those who are along the value chain and users. Uh, and and that's, what we're, that's what we're starting to see. So there's a lot the government can do and our authorities can do. Last point, we need to move you know, with some phasing in and transition uh, to, to level the playing field and make sure this information is available so we can get capital to uh, where the emissions are and, and, and help companies get down, uh, get them down. Wow. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. We, we, we're running out of time. And uh, I, I, I know my colleagues and I are probably all the same. We wish this had gone for a couple of hours. So, so maybe we can get you to come back and, and finish on some of the other discussions we've had. You, you started uh, your conversation with us by talking about your experiences of multiple crises. And it uh, reminded me of uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's comment that a, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Well, you've clearly demonstrated <laughs> to, to, to us that you're a very skilled sailor on this, uh, this tempest of climate change and other things. Uh, on, on behalf of our group, uh, Centers for Climate Solutions, we really uh, want to thank you for this uh, incredible, outstanding and engaging conversations. And uh, once again, uh, I'm hopeful that we can get you back another time, this time face to face. Uh, uh, and, uh, and to continue this, because I, I've just learned so much, so much from you, and then I'm sure the, the, uh, all, all of us have. Um, I just also wanted, because we're leaving now, I just want to thank our staff uh, who've all worked hard to make this possible, particularly Lillianne Delage Larson from the Center of Coyle's office and Amy McKay.